welcome everyone to today's uh, quarantine clinic today we are uh, discussing umn versus lmn so we've taken two clinics so far uh, one is the basics of neurological examination and uh, second is uh, how to approach a case of hemiparesis so to but differentiate between a umn and an lmn lesion so when we talk about umn and lmn what we are discussing is the motor neuron and the motor neuron has two parts that is the upper motor neuron and the lower motor neuron so what do we mean when we say motor neuron we are basically talking about two ends of a tract in our body that connects the brain and the spinal cord and uh, the name of the tract is pyramidal tract so first we need to talk about what is the pyramidal tract and what does it do so <clears throat> this is the brain the brain stem and the spinal cord and let's take this person now this person wants to move his right hand and leg now the way that this happens is the the left side of the brain okay so this is the right side so the left side of the brain will issue a command to the right side of the body to move and the tract that carries this information from the brain to the opposite side of the body is the pyramidal tract okay so this is the rough outline now let's look at it from a little bit more zoomed in perspective and this is the brain this is the brain stem and this is the spinal cord and this is the left side and this is the right side and this is the midline okay now we want to know how does the brain control the body so assuming that this is the limb and we want to move this limb the command has to come from the opposite side so if it is a right limb then the command has to come from the left motor cort cortex so the motor area is the one that is responsible for movement there is another sensory cortex that is responsible for sensations but when we are talking of the pyramidal tract we are talking about the motor cortex now from the motor cortex there leaves this tract this set of nerve fibers leaves the motor cortex and then comes down the brain now as it comes down initially there are a lot of nerve fibers and as they come down they merge into a single tract okay so the shape of it is a bit like this so initially it leaves as a uh, a big diffuse bunch of nerve fibers and as they come down they uh, merge into one uh, solid tract now as they are coming down the zone in the middle over here when it is crossing this area this is known as corona radiata and we discussed this when we talked about hemiparesis and where are the different places where you can have a stroke now after this once the tracts converge into one single unit that area is called as internal capsule and once it merges into a single tract then it doesn't spread out then it carries forward all the way down 
after that it carries down all the way as one single tract now what happens in the brain stem it crosses the midbrain the pons and the medulla if you remember from our neuroanatomy lecture it crosses the midbrain the pons and the medulla and it, from the midbrain and the pons and the medulla you have if you remember all your cranial nerves so all your cranial nerves exit the brain stem from the midbrain the pons and the medulla and any of the cranial nerves that is involved in any of the movement of the face the pyramidal tract will supply once it is done supplying all the cranial nerves this part of the tract is known as cortico bulbar so bulb is the brain stem and cortico is the cortex so from the cortex to the brain stem cortico bulbar tract is the part of the pyramidal tract that supplies the cranial nerves once the cortico bulbar tract has exited then the pyramidal tract will cross over to the other side which is why the crossing over is at the lower end of medulla so after all the cranial nerve fibers have exited then the pyramidal tract will cross over so your pyramidal tract consists of cortico bulbar tract plus cortico spinal tract and after the cortico bulbar tract has exited whatever is left is the cortico spinal tract okay so once the pyramidal tract has left the brain stem it becomes the cortico spinal tract and the cortico spinal tract 85% of the fibers will cross over so let's take it over here let's assume that the cortico bulbar tract has left so all the cranial nerve fibers have exited now whatever is left is the cortico spinal tract and in the cortico spinal tract 85% will cross over and 15% will continue on the same side okay and this is the midline if this is the midline 15% will continue on the same side as the anterior cortico spinal tract and 85% will cross over to the other side as the lateral cortico spinal tract and the function of the anterior cortico spinal tract is to control the midline muscles so the trunk muscles and the function of the lateral cortico spinal tract is to control the limbs so your arms and legs now why did i explain this in such detail because when we say upper motor neuron lesion what we are basically talking about is lesion in the pyramidal tract at some point in this anatomy so if it is a motor cortex lesion then it is a umn lesion that is an upper motor tract lesion if the lesion is anywhere in the brain stem or anywhere in the crossing or anywhere in the spinal cord it is still an upper motor neuron lesion so till where does this go till where does the lateral cortico spinal tract go it ends up in a area of the spinal cord known as anterior horn cell now what is anterior horn cell for that you need to know the anatomy of the spinal cord now in the spinal cord there are two areas one is the outer white matter and the inner gray matter which is opposite to how it is in the brain where the gray matter is outside and the white matter is inside 
in the spinal cord the white matter is outside and the gray matter is inside now what is gray and what is white so the gray matter is the neuronal cell body and the white matter is the axons so what is this neuronal cell body and what is the axon every neuron has a cell body like this and this is the cell body and from the cell body there is a long axon that is that exits the cell body and carries information all the way to the next neuron and this neuron will pick up this information from its dendrites this is the basic structure of every neuron so all the neurons are collected the cell bodies of the neurons are collected in the gray matter and the axons will exit and go down in the white matter and similarly all the axons that are coming in from the brain will travel in the white matter and then whenever they need to speak to another neuron it will enter into the gray matter and speak to the neuronal cell body because axons don't talk to each other much an axon has to talk to the cell body and the cell body will pass the information through another axon okay so in the spinal cord you have a cell body known as the anterior horn cell now as soon as i say cell body you should know that if it is a cell body then it is in the gray matter so it cannot be in the white matter and if it is an anterior horn cell it will be in the anterior part of the spinal cord so in the gray matter there are two horns this is the anterior horn and this is the posterior horn of the gray matter so the anterior horn cell lies in the anterior horn of the gray matter so this is anterior horn cell and the pyramidal tract which has been coming down so the same pyramidal the lateral corticospinal thalamic tract which has been coming down like this actually travels in this area so this is the lateral corticospinal tract so this is the collection of axons that are traveling down the spinal cord now suppose it is traveling down the spinal cord like this so suppose this is the body and you are, you want to try to move your right hand the corticospinal tract will travel down like this from the left brain cross over in the medulla travel down the cervical cord and then exit so how does it exit it exits like this if this is the level of the cervical cord the tract will enter into the spinal cord into the gray matter talk to the anterior horn cell and then the anterior horn cell will take the command forward and then move the hand so at any point if there is a lesion till here so if there's a lesion in the corticospinal tract if there's a lesion in the anterior horn cell till there it is upper motor neuron but from anterior horn cell onwards including the anterior horn cell it is lower motor neuron okay now let's talk about umn versus lmn so the anatomy is what are the structures that can be involved in a umn lesion you can have your motor cortex and you can have your pyramidal tract anywhere from corona radiata internal capsule brain stem or spinal cord and what happens in an lmn lesion where is the anatomy 
it can start from your anterior horn cell onwards so what happens from the anterior horn cell you have your motor nerves and this is via plexus so your anterior horn cell will lead to motor the nerve roots nerve roots will form a plexus the plexus will form nerves that nerves will end up in a muscle and between the nerve and the muscle is a neuromuscular junction so all of these areas are sites of lesion for a lower motor neuron okay so this is the anatomical difference now coming to the clinical differences so what happens in a umn lesion and what happens in an lmn lesion so for that you need to know how the pyramidal tract affects movement now assume that this is a pyramidal tract so this is the left side of the brain and this is a right limb and here is your anterior horn cell okay now the basic concept is that your left brain will tell your right limb to move but this impulse that is traveling down the pyramidal tract is actually an inhibitory one what does that mean your brain needs to tell the right limb to move but this anterior horn cell is already ready to move so your anterior horn cell is always in a state of let me move it let me move it so what the brain is actually doing is constantly stopping the anterior horn cell from moving okay so when you want the limb to move what your brain is actually telling the pyramidal tract is allow it to move okay now this is the main concept now let us imagine what will happen if there is a lesion in your cortex or anywhere in your pyramidal tract if there is a lesion your anterior horn cell has no inhibition anymore so if there is no inhibition it will increase its own movement but you have decreased control so you can no longer control that movement but that anterior horn cell will now start moving the limb on its own so there is hyper excitability okay so if there is a umn lesion what are the things that can happen there is something called tone so when you say tone we mean the definition is resistance to passive stretch so when you stretch your limb every limb has its own resistance because your muscles are pulling against it and the reason for that it is a protective mechanism so supposing this is your arm and somebody suddenly extends it so somebody suddenly pulls your arm your biceps your biceps that are here will automatically resist it so it will pull in the opposite direction because you are you are afraid that if you if somebody extends it too much there could be damage so every muscle has an inherent resistance to passive stretch and that is known as tone now if there is a umn lesion the tone in your muscles increase and this is known as spasticity and the specific name 
for the increased tone in a UML lesion is clasp, knife, spasticity. So what is clasp knife spasticity? There is a kind of knife that is used in the army. So if, you, if you've seen these knives, when you try to open them, initially there is a lot of resistance. So you need to really push to open the knife initially, but after it crosses a certain angle, it will suddenly snap open. It's almost as if all the resistance has been suddenly overcome and the knife will just snap open. So that is known as clasp knife spasticity. So initially there is a lot of resistance and then no resistance. So that is a characteristic feature of a UMN lesion. What else? So what are the other ways in which hyperexcitability could present? There is something known as reflexes. So what is a reflex? A reflex is when you hit on a tendon. So if this is a muscle, every muscle has a tendon. Now that tendon is connected to the spinal cord. And it is it is connected in a way that uh, there is a reflex arc. So if this goes here, it enters through the dorsal, dorsal root and then from the motor root, it will exit and it will cause the muscle to contract. So this is known as the reflex arc and this involves your anterior horn cell. So if your anterior horn cell is now hyper excitable because your pyramidal tract is gone, so there is no inhibition anymore. So now your anterior horn cell will overreact to the smallest of stimuli. So this is known as hyperreflexia. And practically what this means is that if you do your bicep reflex, your triceps reflex, your knee reflex, all these reflexes will be exaggerated. It will be hyperactive. And the reason for that is your hyper excitability of your anterior horn cell. Now, what are the other things that can happen if there is an anterior horn cell problem? The third is you will lose your superficial reflexes. So the reflex that we just spoke about, these are deep tendon reflexes. So when your tendons are uh, excited, when your tendons are stimulated, then your reflex arc is uh, activated and you will have hyperreflexia, but your superficial reflexes are lost. So what are the superficial reflexes? The superficial reflexes are you are abdominal reflex, uh, your cremastric. Okay, so these are your uh, the main superficial reflexes that you need to know about your anal reflex. So these can be lost in an upper motor neuron lesion. Fourth is weakness. Now the weakness in an upper motor neuron lesion is interesting because it is classically a voluntary weakness. So what this means is that your anterior horn cell is okay. There's nothing wrong in your anterior horn cell. There's nothing wrong in your nerves. There's nothing wrong in your muscle. So when you are checking your reflexes, your limbs are moving quite well. In fact, they're moving more than is needed. But when you try to voluntarily move your limbs, you won't be able to because your voluntary control is through your pyramidal tract. So if your pyramidal tract is gone, you can't voluntarily move your muscles, but all the requirements for your muscle to move is actually intact, which is why in pyramidal tract lesion, you can get something known as automatic movement. So, Suppose 
uh, you have somebody with a pyramidal tract weakness and their room catches fire it is possible that they may be able to get up and run because they are not doing it voluntarily it is their uh, their autonomic nervous system has taken over okay so the autonomic nervous system has a separate uh, way of controlling your muscles so this is if only your pyramidal tract is involved then your muscles can still move but your voluntary uh, control of your muscle movement is gone so for all practical purposes there is weakness because weakness is inability to move your muscles now coming to lower motor neuron what happens in lower motor neuron so in lower motor neuron your pyramidal tract is okay okay so the pyramidal tract till here is fine but there is something wrong in either your anterior horn cell or your plexus or the nerve or the neuromuscular junction or the muscle and if there is a lesion in any of this we call it a lower motor neuron so it is this is actually the lower motor neuron proper but any lesion that will involve any of this from the lower motor neuron downwards is called an lmn lesion and what are the characteristics of these first is true weakness so by true weakness i mean there is no way that you can move those muscles if it is a severe lower motor neuron lesion depending on the severity but even or not uh, even if the room is on fire you still won't be able to move because it is your final pathway that has been affected so there is no uh, detour there is no roundabout way of controlling your muscles if your lower motor neuron itself is gone second you have atrophy so what is atrophy atrophy is when your muscles so suppose if your normal muscle is this thick and it has so many muscle fibers if for whatever reason this muscle is not getting used or if this muscle is not getting enough stimulation eventually those muscles will become thin okay this is known as atrophy and in lower motor neuron why this happens is that your this your anterior horn cell is the cell body if you remember and this is the axon so the cell body actually releases nutrients and impulses all the way to the neuromuscular junction and so if there is no impulse reaching the neuromuscular junction there is no release of any neurotransmitter in this case it is acetylcholine and if there is no release of acetylcholine your muscles have zero stimulation and if there is zero stimulation they go into atrophy okay so that is the other thing the third thing is coming back to tone in a umn lesion we said that there is increased tone so spasticity and in an lmn lesion there will be decreased tone so that is known as hypotonia so here your limbs will be flabby and it will be loose there will be no resistance to any movement okay and the other thing we spoke about was reflexes so in an lmn lesion uh, it will be the opposite of umn in umn there was hyperreflexia so in lmn there will be a reflexia or hyporeflexia depending on the severity of the lesion and the reason for this is that when we spoke about the reflex you had two parts of the arc one was the sensory and the one was the motor now in this case we are assuming that the sensory is normal but in the motor this entire pathway from your lower motor neuron your anterior horn cell all the way down the nerve all the way to the muscle this entire pathway is actually the lmn the lower motor neuron pathway so if there is a lesion anywhere your reflexes will go down okay 
and um, finally you have something called as fasciculation now what is fasciculation again let's take the muscle a normal muscle when it contracts all the fibers will contract okay but suppose all the fibers don't contract suppose in a muscle only a few fibers contract here a few fibers contract here a few fibers contract here now only contracting these fibers is not enough to move the muscle so your muscle doesn't move therefore your limb doesn't move but your fibers are still contracting and these are visible so you can see the muscle fibers contracting under the skin but you can also see that your limb isn't moving your whole muscle isn't contracting and this looks like the term used for it is bag of worms so imagine that there is a uh, there is a bag and inside it's full of worms and they are moving but the bag itself is still and you can just see the movement from outside it sort of looks like that you you think you can see the skin continuously moving in different different places but the limb is not moving so this is called fasciculation and the reason this is happening is because your anterior horn cell is supplying these fibers and your anterior horn cell is just trying its best to make the muscle move but because of this problem it is not able to make the whole muscle move so whichever fibers are responding they try to do their best but it is not sufficient okay so this is most commonly seen in an anterior horn cell disease okay so that is fasciculation now let's just revise in umn and lmn in umn you have hypertonia that is spasticity you have increased reflexes you have weakness okay and a uh, loss of superficial reflexes in lmn you have decreased tone decreased reflexes here also there is loss of superficial reflexes so superficial reflexes are lost in both umn and lmn so when you check for superficial reflexes and if they are present then that is actually a good thing because now you know that you there is no umn or lmn you have weakness that is much more okay and um, you also have atrophy so these are the main differences in umn and lmn uh, i'll add a couple of more things there is something called as babinski sign so babinski sign is a uh, it's actually a superficial reflex it is also known as your plantar reflex so there is no tendon involved here but this is exaggerated in a umn lesion so how does this work what you're supposed to do is if uh, this is your foot and this is the great toe uh, you are supposed to rub the the heel of the foot so the down uh, the or plantar surface of the foot in the lateral border okay so from the heel to the up the lateral border of the sole and then medially but you have to avoid the ball of the great toe so till here this stimulation 
will cause the great toe to go up and it will also cause the other toes to fan out and this is known as the babinski sign or the babinski reflex or plantar reflex so when the great toe goes up it is known as extensor plantar okay uh, all right so that that covers your basic umn versus lmn uh, why is this important it is important for localization so when we talk about localization we mean where what and why is the lesion and umn versus lmn is mainly important in the where because once you know if it is umn or lmn then you are able to approach the rest of the uh, history and examination much better okay so you can use these things what we discussed in the differences both in history and examination so in history you can ask for history of if, if it is a umn lesion that you're thinking of you can ask for history of stiffness so that is spasticity you can ask for history of hyperreflexia in the form of something known as flexor spasm so sometimes the hyperreflexia is so much that your uh, legs may spontaneously extend because of some small stimulus which is um, not a not a voluntary stimulus so just by itself it may uh, extend and flex so that is a state of hyper excitability and uh, the, the the patient himself may give this uh, history that uh, my my feet sometimes jerk out on their own another history that you can ask for is clonus so clonus is a continuous back and forth movement of any uh, body part and usually you do have an ankle clonus so especially when they're sitting and they flex their uh, ankle it may trigger a, a clonus and your ankle may go back and forth continuously and this is a history that you can elicit and uh, in lmn you can ask for decreased tone you can ask for atrophy and you can ask for fasciculations so the patient may himself give the history that i can feel uh, something moving under my skin continuously okay so these are things that you can ask in history and then of course when you examine you will examine for each one of these and this will give you a much better idea of where is the lesion and then you can move on to the what and the why so that's about uh, umn versus lmn this is a small discussion but uh, this is useful in every other case that we have discussed and we will discuss all right perfect hello thanks see you guys bye